It's an honor to have such a staunch and compelling advocate for access to justice with us to celebrate the centennial of an institution that does so much to provide that access. So please help me welcome Chief Justice Nathan Hecht. Thank you very much for letting me join you today at this great celebration of the library. Um, good to see my former colleague David Medina and uh, uh, so many of uh, my colleagues on the bench. The uh, court had, uh, Supreme Court had conference this morning and we finished uh, at 1245 uh, and I walked downstairs and got in my vehicle and uh, dr drove here um, counting on Houston traffic to cooperate which is a, a reckless idea under most circumstances, but it worked today. Uh, and so uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, uh, join you here this afternoon. Scientia potentia est. Knowledge is power. Thomas Hobbes wrote that phrase in the Latin edition of Leviathan in 1668. But his point, which was clear in the earlier English edition, was that scientia, by which he meant the natural sciences, are small and unimportant when compared with human powers, particularly the powers derived from the commonwealth and vested in a single leader. When Hobbes wrote that the natural sciences were small and unimportant, Isaac Newton was only nine. Maybe Newton would have talked him out of that. In any event, Hobbes never met Albert Einstein or Steve Jobs. Hobbes may not have been the first to observe that knowledge is power. He may have borrowed it from his old boss, Sir Francis Bacon, who wrote a similar phrase in 1597, Ipsa scientia potestis est, knowledge itself is power. Bacon made the association with association to the deity, arguing that God's power in all things is derived from his knowledge of all things. But the association is just as true in the human context. A seventh century imam meant by the phrase, the same thing we do. Knowledge is power, he wrote, and it can command obedience. A man of knowledge during his lifetime can make people obey and follow him, and he is praised and venerated after his death. Remember that knowledge is a ruler and wealth is its subject, end of quote. The Imam echoed King Solomon's counsel in Proverbs 1,500 years earlier, a man of knowledge increaseth strength. The irony in all this is that whoever first said knowledge is power, whether it was Solomon, a 7th century Imam, Bacon, or Hobbes, did so when knowledge was, or at least long had been, a rare commodity. Before the advent of the printing press in the East in the late 14th century and a few years later in the West with Gutenberg's machine, writings were few and books non-existent. For thousands of years, the principal association between knowledge and power was that knowledge was available only to the powerful or the privileged or fortunate. Knowledge was not so much a way to power as power was a way to knowledge. Now the traffic almost all runs the other way. Knowledge is power, at least where in this country, knowledge abounds. Knowledge is all kinds of power, from the highest seats of government where knowledge of the world's affairs and secrets is constantly studied all the way to, well, my, my car mechanic, who knows what's under the hood of what has become an enormously complex piece of machinery. 
Knowledge is power all the way to the person in your home most adept with the remote. <laughs> Probably your youngest child. There is the power to participate fully in free society. It too comes from knowledge. The framers of the Texas Constitution established a free public school system because they solemnly pronounced, quote, a general diffusion of knowledge is essential to the preservation of the liberties and rights of the people. Since Gutenberg, the principal conduit for this general diffusion of knowledge, essential to preserve people's rights and liberties, has been books. The dependency of free society on access to books has been driven home to us by books themselves, like George Orwell's 1984, a chilling prophecy of life when the content of books is controlled, and Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451 a few years later, portraying life when not just the content, but the very existence of books is controlled. Knowledge is power, but there can be power that surpasses knowledge, and it is tyranny in its vilest form. It is in opposition to a suppression of knowledge and in support of its general diffusion that we gather in celebration of this great public law library. We remember its century of proud and faithful services to the Houston community, the towers of the bench and bar who founded it, James A. Baker, Thomas H. Ball, Judge Charles E. Ash, John C. Williams, R. W. Franklin, James A. Breeding, and Lewis R. Bryan, the many and extensive collections it has housed, historical and current, on display here today. Its present sponsor, Harris County Attorney Vince Ryan, and its staff over the decades and current director, Mary Ann Sears. As we look forward to the future, the next century, we see here as everywhere a new, relatively new, conduit to knowledge, computers, and the internet. Access to knowledge is easier, broader, and quicker than ever through the 25 computer terminals the library provides. The collections the library can access are orders of magnitude greater than the 30,000 volumes it actually houses. And for that expanded service, for the untold tomes as close as the push of a button, there is still no charge. I must mention another important impediment to access to knowledge one that Orwell and Bradbury did not describe, prescient as they were. That impediment is not a hurdle, but a gap. A gap resulting from the gradual separation of knowledge from the people who need it. A drifting apart. People without access to legal services may suffer the deprivation of rights and liberties just as if they were ignorant. American lawyers have formally recognized this for more than a century, forming organizations like the Houston Bar Association's Houston Volunteer Lawyers to provide legal aid to the poor and donating their time and services pro bono publico for the public good. Not just for the good of the poor, though they are greatly helped, and not just for the good of the legal profession, which ennobles itself and its high calling by a selfless, sacrificial service, but pro bono publico, for the good of the public, for the good of us all, in support of the rule of law, in witness to the precious rights and liberties pro bono lawyers protect. A study not long ago at the University of North Texas found that Texas lawyers donate 
more than two million hours of free services annually. Since President Nixon signed the bill creating the Legal Services Corporation in 1974, the Congress has provided funding for legal aid programs throughout the country. In the 1980s, the Supreme Court of Texas created the IOLTA program. And in 2009, as that program faltered, when interest rates fell to zero and stayed there, the Texas legislature began providing more than $9 million per year in public support for basic legal services. The legislature has also, also authorized the Attorney General to designate part of the state's recovery in consumer type actions for legal aid programs, the Jack Pope Act, and Attorneys General Greg Abbott and Ken Paxton have cooperated fully in providing millions of dollars for Texas legal aid. This past session, the legislature designated $10 million for legal services to aid victims of sexual abuse, thanks in large part to Chairman Sylvester Turner and Chairman John Otto, as well as Chairman Joan Huffman and Chairman Jane Nelson. And the legislature provided an additional $3 million for veterans legal aid due to the strong personal support of Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick and Speaker Joe Strauss. Had the legislature not responded as it has, through some very difficult economic times, with challenging budget issues, I cannot see how legal aid in Texas would have survived. Even so, with all this support, an estimated three out of four of the very poor in need of legal services are turned away, and increasingly, Legal services are beyond the reach of middle-class Texans. The high cost of a legal education is partly to blame. Young lawyers must charge high rates to pay student debt. And for that reason and others, lawyers' rates can be very high. And many who need lawyers simply can't afford them. Abraham Lincoln once observed that a person who represents himself has a fool for a client. But increasingly, people try to go it alone, either because they believe they have no other choice or because of what I call the Home Depot effect. I'll fix the plumbing myself. After all, how hard can it be? Lots of flooded homes answer that question. Still, when legal services are not available and people feel, uh, people feel forced to represent themselves, forms and guides can help. The library provides them. Knowledge is power, including the power to obtain justice. The importance of the liberties and rights the framers of the Texas Constitution were so intent on preserving by a general diffusion of knowledge insists, it demands really, that everything possible be done to close what has come to be called the justice gap, the gulf between available legal services and those who need them. Ironically, it comes at a time when lawyers upon lawyers are looking for work as while well, clients after client is looking for help. To that end, the Supreme Court of Texas will soon convene a commission with members from the judiciary, the bar, and law schools and others as well to make every effort possible to close the justice gap. At stake is no less than the integrity of the rule of law. When access to justice depends on means, there is neither justice for all nor justice at all. We have done much to bridge the justice gap. We must do more our society's integrity and our profession's principles allow us to do no less. Libraries are quiet places. It's the thing I like best about them. They're little worlds that you can go off to, not only to find answers, but to reflect on outside turmoils. In the quiet, surrounded by knowledge, there is power. 
power to protect the rights and freedoms of people, power to access justice. This library for a hundred years has been a bastion of legal knowledge for Houston and the community is better for it. That's a good reason to celebrate, to be grateful for the vision and service that have made the library all it is and to wish it continued success. Thanks very much. Thank you.